uh, extremely fortunate to have um, with us Dr. Andrew McLean, um, well renowned in high demand, and we're extremely grateful for his time. So, thank you, Andrew. Right, so it's great to see so many people here, and also I'd, I'd really like to thank Julie for her unsurprising uh, out of the box thinking to get something like this started. I think it's a really good initiative. And I'd also like to say that this, what I'm going to be presenting to you, is a little bit of a journey about the uptake because it hasn't been just a smooth uptake of evidence based training into the horse industry at large. It's been very splintered. But I would like to thank uh, actually Susan Turner Davis um, in the very beginning of my journey urged me with our mutual friend Dr. Sheila White to go down the academic track and, um, and, and start exploring many of these areas and uh, that's led me very much to where I am today. So in talking about the uptake I really need to explain to everybody the, where the problem lies because it's multifaceted. So, oh, so the horse training industry is, um, we've been training horses for such a long time, it's a very old one. And it's a, incidentally about the same amount of time that we've been training elephants and there are very uh, many parallels with that industry as well. The interesting thing is that with animals that, are, that we use in our uh, domestic service, whether we lead them or we ride them, we've learned what we do by trial and error. And it's given us uh, various degrees of success. And because horses have such great abilities in associative learning, it means that we can be fairly hit and miss and still get some degree of success. What the modern understanding of learning gives us is a much greater uh, accuracy in getting the, the answers we want. If we understand the mechanisms or you know, we become like mind engineers to understand how the horse works internally uh, in learning new behaviours, we can be much more efficient and we'll be much safer. So what people do might be very objective, but actually why, how they explain it might not. And often that's uh, something that I've seen very much in my life, is that great trainers are often very good at what they do, but when they tell you what's happening, it's um, often not the story at all. But they believe it because they are uh, unconsciously competent. And of course, many do know what they're doing, so I'm not saying that's true for all, but uh, so much of it is about unconscious competence when you are riding at the highest level. There's also an equestrian narrative which is derived from the horse's place in our psyche uh, that's a result of our use of the horse and the, the respect we have for the horse in the beginnings with uh, the horse in war uh, and then as we moved into agriculture we talked about the horse having a work ethic so it's not just a loyal animal it now has a, a sort of a work ethic and people still talk of this today they say the dressage horse has a work ethic um, and then with the advent of sports we talk about a horse having a will to win and then finally uh, in the last century uh, where horses are used in leisure we talk about the horse in partnership with us the horse cooperating with us and so this gives us a very blurred understanding of what the horse actually is and so to say about training a horse it really doesn't inform us very much at all i use the background here of all of these horse books because in almost all of them they talk about how to ride a horse but there's very little about how to train one there's very little about actually what we do in terms of operant conditioning to train a horse and yet all horse training is based on operant and classical conditioning i'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute we also have some other problems because of the way we use horses because of the horse's place in uh, sport and leisure um, and it's a valuable commodity we have various issues that come from that. Everybody's an expert. Um, often the, uh, the brakes are devalued. This is a current issue about the dangers of horses in eventing. You know, so many people have been killed in the last 30 years in eventing and, and other sports as well. 
And it's interesting to me because when anybody has a riding lesson, it's typical that they're told that you know you have to send the horse forward with your legs, and that's an operantly conditioned signal, which is very powerful because it's about pressure and release. And yet when we talk about slowing the horse, it's fairly unpopular to talk about using the reins as brakes. It's more popular in equestrian circles to talk about using your seat. And kids in pony club get taught this. And yet the seat is learned by classical conditioning, and classical conditioning is known to have uh, much less resistance to extinction, which means that basically it uh, tends to be unreliable and also needs constant uh, updating with, with the reins. And whenever people do use the, the seat, the interesting thing to me, and this came about with my, one of my PhD students, Leslie Horson's work, when we had rain tensiometers on the horses, on the reins, I should say, and riders said they were using their seat, there was always a spike in the rain aid. If we actually got them to actually have no rain pressure at all, the seat worked, but only for about five repetitions, and it gradually got worse and worse. And so what I'm pointing out is that we need to teach people the, eff the effective use of the reins as a basis of slowing the horse and so that it minimises the very subtle signals of just a few, a few grams or a few hundred grams rather than um, avoid it altogether. So that's one of the issues. There's also the issues of money and metals that confounds the whole uh, area of equestrianism. Um, moral disengagement where people believe that their, uh, their own morality can be somehow divorced from any uh, ethical treatment of animals. And then the current issues that are in the various horse sports, including racing, from hyperflexion, that's the overbending of the horse's neck, which has been a really big hot topic in the sports of dressage and eventing, but particularly dressage. Um, the use of the whip in sport, uh, tight nose bands, which is still current and still not fully accepted, even though there's heaps of very good data about how tight nose bands can be in sport at top level competitions. Um, Ola Doherty, Dr. Ola Doherty from Ireland has measured these in a very good PhD study and with, with uh, very good electrical equipment showing that the peak pressures uh, go up to um, 1400 um, milligrams of mercury which is way higher than any human can withstand a tourniquet in their arm. So we need to be considering uh, these things and recent studies of radiographs of horses' nasal platens also show that there are often uh, signs of damage there. Also tongue ties and more recently the use of jiggers. So there's a, there are a lot of confounding issues that are ongoing and that are part of the moral disengagement as well. Now part, the journey is also not helped by science because psychology arose uh, in a very uh, powerful way, uh, largely in North America, but Pavlov, of course, was uh, European. But after him, uh, these were uh, in North America, Thorndike, Watson, Hull, and Skinner. And what they basically talked about was behavior being a product of re reinforcement or reward. Uh, if you use pressure release like we do in horse training with reins and legs, it's about when you stop the pressure, when you terminate it, when you release the pressure. And so it's a really important aspect for us all to understand. And what uh, particularly Skinner was promoting was probably a bit of a bridge too far because he basically saw behaviorism, you know, the understanding of learning and how we can modify behavior as being the ultimate solution for everything. His famous mantra was you could turn a peasant into a lawyer, which of course, um, was fairly horrific at the time, but of course it's true. But those prescriptions really were his downfall. And there were other things that happened in the 1960s. Um, for example, uh, science in itself lost a lot of public appeal because of all of the things that were happening. You know, the, um, uh, the Bay of Pigs and all of that sort of thing with nuclear possible mass destruction um, on, uh, on the horizon. And also in medicine, you know, the thalidomide tragedy. And uh, in the environment, Rachel Cullison wrote a book about, um, or called Silent Spring, about 
the use of DDT and um, the results of DDT using deforestation, pollution, etc. And that coupled with Watson and Skinner's ambitious claims about turning peasants into lawyers uh, was really the demise of behaviourism. It became something that was very unpopular in the United States to the point where words like or terms like operant conditioning, which were very prominent in the 1960s, never appeared again for another 20 years in, in an American psychology journal. And it was replaced by what we call cognitive psychology, and it's now known as the cognitive revolution in psychology. And this change is quite important for us to consider with horses because um, it led to ethology being the only guiding light in terms of how we interact with horses. Now, ethology is not the study of learning. Ethology is the study of hardwired behaviours in animals, things like the herd instinct, uh, their social orders, all of those sorts of things. And that was championed in uh, Europe. And in 1921, uh, Schnellgrub Abbey coined the term pecking order, which came from his studies in chickens, which has now um, seen to be a little bit flawed in certainly applying that to other animals, uh, had great problems. And it's been seen that in many species, dogs, including the studies of wolves, and also of horses, that there's no clear pecking order in that. It's not a, not a hierarchy. A could dominate B for a certain resource, and it's very much resource related. B could dominate C, but C could turn around and dominate A. And it can also alter uh, in terms of satiation. And yet this was uh, grasped with great enthusiasm by horse people because behaviorism and learning theory had already been killed in the USA. And that changed so much. So the animal hierarchy was privileged. Of course, it appealed to us as humans because, you know, the military and the state, and business and church and school, even families were um, built on the ideas of hierarchies. You know, the, whoever's the boss can ne never be, um, uh, and you know, can never be toppled or questioned. And so that became quite a significant issue that resulted in. The, new, the rise of what we call the New Age trainers, you know, the horse whisperers, which so much of what they do is good, but so much of what they say isn't very accurate. And the pecking order was really something that people loved to hear because it gave ideas of dominance in a, in a relationship between a human and horse. And that doesn't mean you, you shouldn't be assertive, because of course you should. You need to be very clear what you want to do, and you need to stick to your guns and do your best to achieve it. But it's not about the horse seeing you as a dominant animal. There's no evidence of that any more than an elephant. And of course, if it was true with elephants, um, we would never train them because they're just so much bigger and stronger. It's much more about how we reinforce behaviours. So these new age character descriptors came about. We talk about the alpha horse, the dominant horse, the, you know, the alpha mare. And we talk in terms of submission, disrespect and leadership. And all of these things really don't tell us much about what the horse is. Now, just a little bit about my journey, because I'm going to tell you now uh, how we came about to uh, try and embed this in the horse world. Um, I'm a zoologist um, with a double major in zoology, and I taught at university for a number of years in zoology. And, um, and then, I was also involved with uh, eventing and uh, show jumping and, and dressage and, um, and I raced horses bareback uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, in 1994, I began the Australian Equine Behaviour Centre and I began my PhD in that in 2000, so I finished my PhD in 2004. So this was a bit my journey and what I wanted to do in a paper in 2005, I wanted to explain about how we need to understand learning and it wasn't really a safe place for this knowledge to be in the hands of commercial operators. It's much better if universities become the knowledge base of horse training in a field of uh, equitation science. 
So I went on and I published uh, many journal papers in um, author and co-authoring positions. And now I run uh, the Equitation Science International, which is a, uh, um, an education facility. So, what I've found is that in line with a quote that I had of Schopenhauer's on the front page of my presentation, when you're trying to change behaviours and embed a little bit of science, I thought it would be quite an easy task. But it's not at all, because there's a lot of resistance when you try and change tradition. And of course, learning theory is only some 50, 60, 70 years old. And so first of all, there's a lot of uh, shock and it goes through those cycles of denial and even aggression and uh, whatever. And then you also get to a place where maybe you're, you're also ignored. And then finally people tell you, well, that's, um, oh, that's already what I do do. And that seems to me like the uh, end result. And I'm hoping it is because a lot of people say that and I'm very glad that they do. Because what actually you will see is that understanding learning is very much a way of describing what top trainers do already do. It's just that they don't know it. Um, they, they wouldn't get there if they didn't use learning theory well because training is all about learning processes. Um, we also need to extinguish the idea of the naughty horse because that is a really big problem. We need to recognise that if we use negative reinforcement, and of course we do, we also use positive reinforcement, but if we use negative reinforcement, it's about the release of pressure. It's not about the pressure itself, it's the removal. That's why it's called negative reinforcement. The critical elements of that is that, A, we must make sure that the strength of that aversive stimulus has to meet the sensitivity of the animal. And so that's about feel. That's what poor strains call feel. Then that pressure has got to be terminated. Now, so many people talk about release of pressure, and that's a good thing, but it is really critical to recognise that. And many people don't, and they get into problems. And then there's a glass ceiling because there's no way for them to understand how to solve their problems. The animal also needs to be in a sufficiently relaxed state to basically to learn and so they can uh, trial a response that might lead to the release of that pressure. And then we've got to ensure, and it will happen, if we always begin with a light aid, which has been said in the texts for many years, if we begin with a light aid, then that aid will rapidly shrink through classical conditioning, in other words, through a, the predictable association of something that happens first, to that light signal, which means the stronger pressure and soon comes to mean just simply the response. If we neglect any of those conditions, it can lead to substantial problems, conflict behaviours, hyperactivity, or excessive fear in the horse-human relationship regardless of the training method. So, in saying that, we need to recognise that the mistakes we can make with negative reinforcement, and this is, this is the problem to me, this is what is a large part of my work, and it's exactly the same with the elephants. Mahouts have been training elephants for 5,000 years, and yet, using this technology, we can break in one much quicker than they can in their traditional ways, because instead of thinking to make the elephant submissive, or the horse, we need to re recognise that we just need to reinforce the correct response. If we reinforce inconsistently or the wrong response, and we don't remove the pressure, we don't gradually build up to the right answer, we end up with problems, and often dangerous ones. Positive reinforcement, where we give the animal something attractive also to increase the behaviour, also has some problems as well. Um, we need to recognise that because positive reinforcement is a new wave in animal training and we have to also recognise that any form of training is exploiting the animal and that's okay, I'm comfortable with that. I'm in the same boat as uh, Professor Mellor, I'm an animal welfare person. So we need to do it well but we must be honest about what can go wrong with any form of training. So in positive reinforcement where the problem might lie is often the reinforcement or the delivery of food is stopped when we're actually expecting something better, when we're shaping a behaviour. For example, we want the animal to lift its leg, 
we've already got it this high, now we want it higher, and so we don't reward it lifting its leg at that height anymore. We're waiting for it to give a better response, which is living, lifting its leg higher, but it doesn't know the answer. So often there's a little bit of frustration that creeps in there. Again, my work with elephants, because they're not a domestic animal, they're a wild animal, they're not domestically bred, and have a very short fuse, when things go wrong, then they start to get aggressive. And I've just been to a conference in Thailand on uh, the training of elephants in a more ethical way, and um, the positive reinforcement, people who use only positive reinforcement, tell me that the most safe way for them to do their job is behind a wall, because then they can be, feel safe if the animal does get aggressive. And they, they do, in any form of training they can do, especially if there's some frustration. And also in positive reinforcement, um, if we change the schedule of reinforcement, in other words, if we're not reinforcing the behaviour every single time it gives the right answer, but now we do it every other time, which is an important part of training in positive reinforcement, we call it a, a variable schedule of reinforcement, it makes the behaviour much stronger, and yet the animal doesn't know why it's not getting rewarded and we can get aggression. So we need to realise that this can very much affect the animal's affective states. That's it, you know, it's, it's emotional response and it's also feelings of whether it's going to try or not a new learned response in the future. We call these um, effect, positive and negative affective states. So conflict behaviours can appear, um, they can be a result of all of those things that I mentioned. But particularly negative reinforcement when you get it wrong is more dangerous than positive reinforcement when you get it wrong. And it can lead to all sorts of difficult situations, um, with, especially with conflicting motivations of, for example, stop and go. And so this led myself and Jana Winter Christensen from Denmark to propose this uh, notion of conflict theory, that we need to embed this in the scientific literature, which we've now done, so that trainers and uh, and scientists can start to understand that these are important aspects that we need to understand in human-animal interactions. There are all sorts of conflict behaviours that arise from various things that we train by mistake. So mistakes in training the go button can cause the horse to stall or balk or become lazy to kick out, but also to buck and rear. Similarly, mistakes of the brakes and the stop signals can result in bolting, bucking and rearing. And even mistakes in training turns can enable the horse to learn that there's an out through turning one way or the other. And if it happens to develop faster and faster, we call it shining. But we need to recognise, therefore, that the way we retrain those is to go back and reinstall these behaviours using uh, reinforcement more correctly. We also have to recognise as scientists that there's a big difference between sheer discomfort and conflict behaviours because in my experience at uh, conferences, many scientists even use the word conflict behaviour incorrectly when really they're just talking about discomfort. For example, mouth opening and closing could be more discomfort than actually a conflict behaviour. It may well be, but it's likely to be discomfort too. We have also, I'll just raise the size of that, um, through the International Society for Equitation Science, which um, uh, I was a, a, a co-founder, we have these 10 first training principles and we have done our best to distribute these and publish them in many different languages. This is about the full third or fourth iteration, which I worked on last year, and I think this is pretty much evenly balanced and where we want to be right now. Uh, but as David said, it's a move, in his work, it's a moving feast as well. You know, it's something that will continue to be updated as we get more knowledge. But it's just very important that we do have a regard for safety, for the nature of horses, uh, for their mental and sensory abilities, for their emotional states, uh, that we use desensitization methods correctly, that we understand and use operant conditioning correctly and classical conditioning, that we shape behaviours, we don't just expect a response. We, for example, teach something like Piaf 
or leading into the race barriers, just step by step. We don't just force the horse in all the way because he doesn't learn much doing that. The correct use of signals, because it's important for the animal to recognise what it is next time, so it must be easily, easily discriminated. It needs to be given singly, not together, because if it's given as a compound aid, it must always be presented as a compound aid. So we need to recognise that rein and leg, which are opposing, are more like music, where one thing may follow another, and I'm talking particularly about dressage because that's more the most complex of all. But it's possible to train the horse to the highest level from, with single notes and no chords. And therefore the animal can get to where we want in a way that he can understand. And many people do it that way. Uh, Kira Curtin is one who springs to mind. And also a regard for self-carriage. And that is all about when we train an animal to do something to go he should then be trained and reinforced to go without any further signalling. If we have to keep kicking him or poking with our toes in his ears, if it's an elephant, or squeezing with our legs on his body if it's a horse, or with the spurs, it leads to problems. So how behaviour is changing, and this has been the other part of my journey, is um, I've been the coach for the British Horse Society, and um, there are big changes there. They have a new CEO, so I'm very pleased about that because the British Horse Society is quite an um, impregnable stalwart of uh, old-fashioned training and riding. And um, I'm really pleased to see where it's going right now. Um, I work in Pony Club Australia. I'm on the board, and we're also working on um, the syllabus there. Uh, and we keep the world in that, and I'm very proud of that. And um, I will see in the future that many countries will follow this, this lead. Also my work with national federations, um, I've given many clinics when these NFs in uh, various countries in Europe and uh, here in Australia. My, I've been also pushing it in the Global Dress Art Forum, which is probably the most uncomfortable place to do it, uh, with 500 uh, well-qualified people in the dressage world who weren't ready to hear this in 2006 or in 2010 or even in 2012. <laughs> well, I presented there a, um, a, a more objective way of judging dressage, which I still think is so much better. And based on the, the changes that have been made in gymnastics and diving as well. And um, it was met with dead silence, so uh, I wasn't too sure if that was good or bad. But the North American Western Dressage Association uh, have adopted this judging scale and they've been doing all sorts of studies telling me how effective it is. And the judges who've been judging for less than six years really appreciate it and like it because it's so transparent and the riders like it too. It's the older judges that don't like it so much because change is difficult. Also my work with international clinics in very other, many other countries but I also need to recognise there are many other people doing good things. Jody Hartstone in New Zealand has single-handedly pretty much made noseband changes in New Zealand. And Gemma Pearson in the UK has uh, uh, conducted many behaviour workshops for vets, teaching vets how to change behaviours and desensitise horses to uh, apparatus and, and injections. Uh, which were previously difficult for them to manage. And it is so much easier when we understand learning theory. And we do the same thing with the elephants. If an elephant's difficult to uh, have ointment put in his eye, instead of you know, tying every leg to the, to, to the crush, including a tusk, um, it's much easier to just use positive reinforcement and teach him that when you touch his eye, he gets food and it takes less than 15 minutes to get the animal very happily, almost throwing his eye at you and at the ointment to have this done. Um, also, Racing Victoria uh, with their off the track program, which um, through my work with the Australian Equine Behaviour Centre and now my son Alistair, um, we've had quite a bit to do with that, and that's a great program and that's a, a, a really positive behaviour change. Um, harness Racing Australia, um, I was involved with the development of whip-free harness racing. It wasn't actually my idea. 
I have to say, but I was involved to help them navigate once they uh, said that this was going to happen and it was agreed to by all the member states and then disagreed later. But when they did agree, they called me in and then I became the whipping boy, so to speak. <laughs> and um, and uh, but my job was purely to navigate how you would teach trainers to do a better job without relying on the whip so much or at all. I mean, there were going to have a um, an instrument of some sort in their hand, which was long enough, which you may be called a whip, but probably more of a carrot stick or something like that. Um, and also I've done a lot of work in uh, forensics. I'm probably the most used expert witness in the country. I do many cases. Um, and that has also gives some credibility to uh, a more evidence-based understanding of learning theory. Um, and f I don't regard these as personal rewards. I regard them more as rewards for the uptake of the uptake of learning theory throughout the world. But um, we won the Eureka Science Prize in 2010, and then um, you I know, uh, won the Daniel Fellows Scholarship in 2014, which really gave me that was about history because I wanted to pursue the history of horse riding and training because. So many people who challenged me would say, ah, oh, but it's classical. And I wondered what classical really was. And I'm none the wiser. Um, because every country has its own version of what classical writing really is. And then in 2018, I received the Flambeau Award from the Italian Equestrian Federation. So this is all part of the, the, the long journey. I need to also then move on to say my work is also with the elephants in this interspecies understanding because that's a good way of teaching horse people that horses aren't that special. All animals learn this way and it even works with more, uh, with non-domestic animals like elephants. So we began in Nepal, um, the two dots there, and they're in red because it was a different organisation and then we formed our own Australian organisation called Human Elephant Learning Programs and we've been working in North East India and Southern India, and we have, we're at workshops where all the neighbouring states and the head trainers come for those workshops. And then we went to Thailand, Myanmar, uh, and Laos. And so that covers five countries, and now it's, uh, it's well embedded across Asia. And our hope, or our aims are to produce Mahu training schools. So for me, this is a similar thing, and that's why I'm adding to this horse thing about these elephant programs, is because education really is the key. For the Mahouts, it's very much about social economics because Mahouts are largely the most, um, are the underclass. In, in, in Nepal, for example, they're the lowest of all the castes. So it is really something to consider that we can't really improve animal welfare very easily without improving human welfare either. And I'm heading towards the end. And so this is really a, um, my additions to uh, getting people to understand about horse behaviour in terms of care and welfare and discriminating between those two things. And that's where I think the five domains really shines. And the, it's all very well to care for horses, and we do, and that's what the five freedoms was about, is to my mind, we cared for horses. You know, we wanted them to have good nutrition and all those sort, sorts of things. But there are other aspects as well that's all about living a better life. So instead of just talking about a life that cripples, we should focus much more on what makes a life worth living. And so horses have social needs. They do need to socialise. And so we, if we can give to that, to some extent at least, that will make a difference to the horse's life. The horse has needs for movements, as well, to move, for movement in space. Now the communication and mental stimulation is also about choice, but it's very much about our communication with the horse, and this is, a re this is really the big part of my life, is at that part where we teach people that the animal has a need to communicate with the world to make its life predictable. And we're part of that world and we need to train animals very clearly so that it is totally predictable for the animal and therefore more predictable for us. 
I've also gone a little bit further with that, um, with the elephant one as well. This is what I did last week. And um, it's exactly the same, but I've added this other aspect, which I would have done the same with the horse one, this green area foraging needs, except that I felt guilty asking Simon Kneebone to draw it all over again, because he's already drawn it four, three or four times for me, and, um, and for no charge. So, as far as I'm concerned, this is a very similar thing for horses. There are many other needs as well, but what I try to explain to people is that if we don't acquiesce to the animal's needs for these things, we see various problems. And this shows up in the horse's mental welfare. For example, we might see stereotypical behaviours. We see them in elephants where they sway. We see it in horses where they wince up and weave and crib bite. And we know from studies in Utrecht in the Netherlands that if the animal, if the horse, for example, has more access to low-grade fibre, in other words, it's just chewing for more hours in the day, it's less likely to crib bite. And if he has access to uh, group stapling, which is possible for it, certainly with young horses, is less likely to show other stereotypical behaviours like um, uh, stable, uh, you know, what do you call it, um, when they're weaving. Uh, I had to do it to discover. Um, and so he, they, these things are really pivotal for the animal. So for me, these are, these are four pillars that are uh, larger than the thing I wanted to talk to David about is, um, is it possible that we could uh, rank some of these as uh, more essential than others? Maybe we can't. But I see that these needs in horses, it's not just something the horse wants to do, it's not something it just wants to eat for 13 hours a day, which is the average amount in a feral horse. Um, it's not just that he needs the space to, or wants the space to move, and it's not just so much that he just wants to be with or be able to touch and see other horses. He actually needs to. And when we deprive him of this, you know, he has, has neural pathways that are devoted to this that are fairly much impossible to eradicate through selective breeding. When we don't give to this, we will, we will see the emergence of problems. So somehow we've got to navigate through all of this to make the best life possible for horses. And so, thank you very much.